Greetings to all of you, members and friends of uh, Grace Church in Harrisburg. I am standing, as you can see, uh, in the magnificent sanctuary at Grace Church here on State Street at the foot of the Capitol steps, uh, a prominent place where we are noticed by many. I, um, am, I continue to be saddened that we are not able to gather here um, uh, right now. But uh, the time will come again, and it will be soon, I hope, when we're able to fill this, uh, this place again with, uh, with our presence and with our voices and with our, our friendship. It will be good to be together again, something that we anticipate and look forward to. While we are absent, however, there is much that is, that is still uh, going on here and much that is happening. Uh, Justine Compare is still managing the office and keeping things going here for us. Um, uh, Chuck Houts is still uh, is living here, of course, and keeps his eye on this place and keeps things in good order, uh, repaired and operating and clean. Um, Shelley Mormon Stallman is hard at work, as we see uh, week by week. Uh, you, we see and hear. Um, uh, musicians uh, playing in this sanctuary, and of course Shelley puts it all together and makes these, uh, these videos that we are able to uh, enjoy and that we find inspiring week after week after week. Um, I spend a bit of time here too each week. Much of the work that I do I can accomplish from home. Um, but I still enjoy uh, being in touch with many of you. I've, I've been able to reach most of you uh, on the telephone. Um, uh, some I have tried and tried, but have not been able to track down. Um, but uh, uh, we do; we are doing all that we can to stay connected and uh, to connected with each other and and connected with uh, with the God whom we serve. I'm making this recording uh, today um, on Tuesday, the day before the inauguration of a new administration in Washington, and uh, as you know. The, um, uh, the capitals, including our capital here on State Street, are locked down due to the threat of violence. Um, I, uh, uh, I'm discouraged by that, as I know you are. Uh, but uh, it is our responsibility to take note of such things and to do all that we can as followers of Jesus to remedy that kind of violence and the, the kind of of lack of communication that we find between, uh, between factions in our culture that makes hatred and misunderstanding uh, and violence grow. So I, um, I hope that we're able, even in times like this, uh, to discover and to take action upon those kinds of responsibilities, the responsibility we have to, uh, to remedy uh, to violence and to diminish conflict as, uh, as best we can. Uh, would you pray with me? We stand before you today, God, grateful for all that you are to us, the one who sent to us the Prince of Peace, in whose train we follow. You are the one who gave us the wonders and the mysteries of creation and set us in the midst of, us, midst of it, uh, giving us dominion over what you had made. Give to us, God, the wisdom and the strength that we need to care for your creation and to care for each other in the ways that caring needs to be exercised today. It is challenging and difficult in a time of violence and lack of understanding, a time of, of, uh, of, of hatred and division, to be agents of reconciliation and love, to be agents of grace, but those are challenges which your people have, have a, a faced in every age, and so we face them in ours. Give us the strength, the wisdom, the grace, the compassion, the love that we need uh, to represent you and your ways among a divided people in a treacherous time. Move among us with the spirit of Christ. Draw us ever closer to you. Make us more and more thoroughly your own people, that we might serve you with, with diligence and strength all our days. For we offer ourselves to you along with our prayers in the name and in the spirit of Jesus. Amen.
3, 1 through 5, and 10. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah on the, sec the second time, saying, Arise, go to Sinaba, the great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. So jo Jonah arose and went to Nineveh, according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. Then he cried out and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put a sackcloth from the greatest of them to the least of them. As you may recall, last year at this time, the Grace Church Choir was blessed by the addition of Brazilian students who were studying at Lebanon Valley College as part of a culture exchange program. Although they are not present with us in person this year, they continue to bless our video ministry and we continue to hold them in our thoughts and prayers. I'm always amazed by the number of friendships that develop throughout these culture exchanges. And this year, Faith Roberts, one of our Grace Church soloists, and Pedro developed a special friendship. She is currently in Brazil spending the Christmas holidays with Pedro. I invited both of them to sing a duet to share with our ministry today. We ask that you keep in your prayers Natalia, who participated in the program in 2016. This past week, she lost her grandfather from COVID, and her father remains seriously ill in the hospital with COVID. We ask that God bless this family and comfort them during this difficult time and that her father may improve and return to the home soon. Amen. Take me deeper in. 
Psalm 62, 5 through 12. Truly my soul waits for God. From him comes my salvation. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will you attack a man? You shall be slain, all of you, like a lean wall in a tottering fence. They only consult to cast him down from his high position. They delay in lies. They bless in their, with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. My soul, wait silently for God alone, for my expectation is from him. He is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. And God is my salvation and my glory, the rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in him at all times, you people. Pour out your heart before him. God is a refuge for us. Lord, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. Jesus, light of the world, shine upon us. Set us free by the truth you now bring us. Shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Praise, Spirit, praise. Set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow. Flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let them be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your radiance. By the blood I may enter your brightness. Search me, try me, consume all my darkness. Shine on me. Shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, blaze, spirit, blaze. Set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. We are in the Gospel of Mark at the beginning of Jesus' public ministry uh, as he is uh, calling uh, his first disciples. Mark 1, beginning at verse 14. Now, after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. As Jesus passed along the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. And Jesus said to them, Follow me, and I will make you fish for people. And immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, who were in their boat mending their nets. Immediately he called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. This is the gospel of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I remember one day when I learned one of the most important lessons of my life. It was an ordinary day in every other way, but I learned something that day that has been helpful and useful and empowering and transforming for me ever since. I'd like to tell you about it, but I want to warn you that when you first hear it, it may sound a bit overly simple, so I'll need to explain. You may conclude that I was pretty naive if it took me until I was 22 to learn it just a couple of years ago. 
When I went to graduate school, to seminary, I did it full time for three years. In order to do so, I worked several part-time jobs. I was a graduate research assistant for one of the professors. I was organist at a local church, and I worked one of the university switchboards for several hours a week. On this particular afternoon, I had finished working at the switchboard and I was leaving the building. It had been a particularly draining day, and that must have shown in my demeanor. Walking down the hall, I encountered one of my teachers, one of the older, wiser variety. And he remarked simply, hard day, Mike? Yes, I said. And to top it all off, the calls at the switchboard drove me nuts. So many calls for those who were not in their offices. Lots of messages to take. One call after another after another. It simply wore me out. His name was Stuart Henry. He was professor of American Christianity, and he's the one who said it. That remark that was transforming and empowering to me. And this is what he said. You know, Mike, there's something about telephones that you must remember. Just because it rings doesn't mean you have to answer it. <laughs> sounds, sounds simple, doesn't it? But it was one of those moments of revelation for me. Why hadn't I thought of that before? You don't have to answer the thing just because it rings. I suppose I had been conditioned by my family members who would drop anything and everything to run through the house and grab the phone when it rang. In those days, you only had one telephone, you remember. Ours was in the kitchen at first and then later on in the living room. And sometimes it was a race with injuries as we ran for the phone. I remember standing in in checkout lines at any number and variety of stores, long lines, lots of waiting, only to reach the head of the line when the phone rang. Of course, the caller got priority. Didn't have to wait a moment as the clerk raced to grab the phone and attended to their need, despite the fact that I and those behind me had been waiting for 10 or 15 minutes. This was long before anything like cell phones existed, and there was no such thing as caller ID. Now, if you look at your phone and you see who's calling or you don't recognize the number and you don't want to talk with that person, you just put the phone back in your pocket and go on. So things have changed some. But even now, I don't hear someone's phone ring that they don't at least look at who's calling. And I've been interrupted in any number of times and places and conversations by those who need to take a call. One of my colleagues told the story a few years ago of officiating at a wedding. And the, the bride and her father were processing down the aisle when the, the telephone rang in the bride's mother's purse. And she took the call. The first thing she said was, we'll have to make this quick. I'm at my daughter's wedding. The pastor said he nearly walked forward and took the phone out of her hand and threw it out the window. Someone once called it telephone tyranny because the telephone can grab our attention from anyone, anything, anytime, instantly. As our world has evolved, there are lots more tyrannies that have been added, things that can steal our attention from more important, even momentous things, the tyranny of the telephone, of course, but there's also the tyranny of email, of video games, of television, of sports, the tyranny of the camera. A couple of years ago, I saw what I, I thought was a humorous news report on the television. I'm not sure that the, the, the person who aired it thought it was humorous, but I thought it was. The reporter was at the White House at lunchtime on a day when President Obama took orders from his staff for burgers. And then he went 
downtown to get them at the local Five Guys franchise. Well, he walked, the, the, the camera showed the president walking into the restaurant. And as he did, the camera swung around from seeing him come through the door to looking at those who were behind the counter as he walked in to catch their reaction. That's what I thought was funny. I think if I had been in their position, if I'd been behind the counter and the President of the United States walked in, after I overcame my initial shock, I would have stepped up and greeted him or her and asked how I might be helpful. I would have not been able to resist extending my hand for a handshake. The opportunity of a lifetime. But that's not what happened behind the counter. All of them stepped back with their cell phones held up to take a picture. At the end of the day, they all had a picture of the president. But they had missed the opportunity to talk with him, to shake his hand, to share a smile or a moment. They had a picture to show their friends, but they had missed the moment of a lifetime in order to get it, the tyranny of the cell phone. Well, whether it's, it's telephones or cell phones or television sets or video games or computer or email, the issue is the same. This is what I really learned that day in the hallway when Professor Henry said to me, just because the thing rings doesn't mean you have to answer it. We get ourselves caught up in a habit of trying to please too many people at a time. We want to please everybody, from those who call us on the phone, to those who email us, to those who friend us on Facebook, to those who will be impressed with the pictures we've taken. From parents to children, friends to neighbors, spouses to supervisors, employers to employees, we are typically caught in a pattern of wanting to, needing to, trying to please everybody. And we've come to believe that we need to be always available, always accessible, always in touch with everybody all the time. And so we carry in our pockets telephones, email, voicemail, Facebook, newscast, television, sports, games, and so on and on and on. Always available, always accessible, always in touch with everybody and everything all the time. Trying to please too many people at once, it's exhausting. Believe it or not, there are stories in the Bible about those who tried to please too many people at once and of how much trouble it made for them. There are also stories of those who avoided that temptation. Let me tell you one of each. The Old Testament book of Jonah is a fascinating story. As it began, Jonah was called by God to deliver a message to the people of Nineveh. Turn from your wicked ways, God called to them. Well, Jonah was not anxious to go to Nineveh. It was a dangerous place. It was a foreign place. And he knew, Jonah knew, that his visit and his message would not be pleasing to the people of Nineveh because they were not worshipers of God. So how in the world could Jonah please everyone? His solution was pretty common. He could please the people of Nineveh and he could please himself by staying away from the city. And he could please God by, well, running away, out of sight, out of mind, you know. So Jonah booked passage for himself on a ship to Tarshish, a distant foreign place where he could escape the presence of the Lord. But a massive dangerous storm put the ship and all who were on it at risk. And having learned that Jonah was fleeing from God's presence, they blamed him for the storm and threw him overboard. It was then that a big fish swallowed him and held him in its belly for three days and three nights, then deposited him on the shore. The word of the Lord came a second time to Jonah, instructing him to proclaim God's word and warning to the people of Nineveh. Jonah went to the city 
the people received his message well, surprisingly, and the story continues from there. Jonah was guilty of a number of things, but primarily he was trying to keep everybody happy and it proved impossible. He was trying to keep himself comfortable and happy. He was trying to avoid displeasing the people of Nineveh and he was trying to avoid God's displeasure. Jonah made quite a mess for himself. As you might expect though, Jesus is the one who got it right and encourages us to do the same. As Mark tells Jesus' story, he had been baptized by John in the Jordan, he had been tempted in the wilderness, and then he returned to Galilee proclaiming his message. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. He then began to gather his disciples. As Jesus walked along the shore of the Sea of Galilee, he saw Peter and Andrew, James and John. He called them to follow him. Follow me and I will make you fish for people, was his promise. Simon and Andrew were, were casting a net into the sea. They were quite busy in the act of fishing, occupied with their work at the moment. James and John were on their boat mending nets, engaged in a vital aspect of their work with their hired men and with their father, also quite busy. Jesus called them to follow him, and Mark reports that immediately, at once, without delay, they followed Jesus, leaving everything else and everyone else behind them. And from that time on, they were not distracted with others or with other important things. They followed Jesus. With those who followed Jesus, there was a singleness of devotion. They didn't fall into the trap of trying to please too many people at once. They walked with Jesus. They followed Jesus first and foremost, allowing nothing else to get in their way, nothing else to deter or distract or divert them from their way. They did not, however, follow Jesus to the exclusion of everyone else. They didn't ignore others. They didn't become insensitive to others or abandon the people who needed them. They simply placed Jesus first, and somehow the rest of their life went on and even flourished because of it. Wouldn't it have been a cosmic calamity if at that moment, as Jesus was walking by, calling Simon and Andrew from their fishing, James and John from their boat, if their cell phones had rung and they had said, wait just a minute, I have to take this call. <laughs> or if instead of following Jesus, they had instead stepped back to take his picture as he passed by. If it hadn't been a cell phone or a camera, it would have been something else if Simon or Andrew, James or John had attempted to please too many people at once. But what they were able to do, what Jonah was not able to do, was to sharpen their focus on the most important thing and pursue the most important thing first, allowing all others to follow in their places. A colleague of mine told the story of, of uh, hearing Billy Graham speak at a banquet a number of years ago. His style was very different in that small setting than it was before crowds at stadiums where we typically would see him speak. He certainly wasn't, my friend told me, he wasn't an overpowering presence or a good or polished speaker. Really, he was just speaking off the cuff. And my friend said, I remember one thing he said that night. He said that if he had his life to do over again, if he could take up his ministry all over again, he wondered that if, if rather than in preaching to the masses as he had done, whether it would have been more effective for him to choose just 12 people as Jesus did, pour his heart into them and encourage them to do the same, maybe that would have had a larger and more lasting impact on the world. I think maybe... Billy Graham was struggling with this thing that we've been talking about this morning, trying to please too many people at the same time, trying to do too much at once. 
the point he was making was that the most critical thing we can do in ministry is to pour our lives into others, so much so that it makes a difference. But it's so easy to become distracted, to try to do too much. I don't know what all the demands and distractions of your life are. I imagine most of them are much the same as mine. But I also know that our lives are unique in some ways too. What I do know is that you, like me, are prone to get caught in the trap of trying to please too many people all the time. It wears us out. It wastes our life. I, I've learned to ignore the phone sometimes. Dr. Henry would be proud. And I don't have any trouble going two or three days without checking my email. I hope the next time that you're faced with trying to please too many people at once, you'll remember the story of Jonah. And you'll remember the stories of Jesus' disciples. And that will help make life more manageable and less stressful for you. Finally, I hope you'll reach the place where you can consider what I've said today at a deeper level. From every corner of the Christian witness comes the insight that if we place God, if we place Jesus first in our life and first in our devotion, all the other demands and obligations don't go away. Some of them become more urgent, but they will stand a much better chance of falling into their places and remaining manageable than if we try to please too many people at one time. Amen. Pray with me. Move among us with your gracious spirit, loving God. Make us more and more thoroughly your own daughters and sons, your own children. Make of us the people that you would have us to be. Show us how in his life and his ministry, Jesus was careful to set priorities and to hold on to them. He didn't try to touch everyone. Instead, he poured himself into those who were closest to them and then sent them out to touch others on his behalf. And thereby, he extended his influence far beyond what he himself could have done and through time, far beyond what he could have lived, even if his life had been full and had, had, um, had given him the blessing of many years. In fact, we can say that um, his influence, his life, his ministry continue in our time, 2,000 years, more than 2,000 years after his birth. Still, we are following Jesus. Still we are hearing his teachings. Still we understand and try to implement his values. Move among us with your spirit. Make us more and more thoroughly your own sons and daughters, your own children, so that we might live as Jesus lived and represent his life, his love, and his ministry, his values among the people with whom we live today, and thereby extend Jesus' influence even in our time. It seems there hasn't been a time, and certainly there hasn't been a time in our own life and experience, when Jesus' influence needs to be extended more than it does now. For we see unrest in many places across our own city, across the neighborhoods where we live and across our nation. It is a momentous time, but it is a difficult and challenging time. We celebrate the accomplishment of developing a vaccine to successfully treat a worldwide pandemic and achieving that vaccine, not just a new vaccine, but a new kind of vaccine in record time. And now it is being applied to people and given to folks so that this pandemic might come to an end. But even as we celebrate and anticipate that achievement, other things seem to be falling apart. How often that's the way it is, God 
when we try to attend to too many things at once in our own lives. Help us to identify priorities and, and, to, uh, and to live in such a way that we keep you at the center of our lives, your, your values, your presence foremost in our thinking, and your, your love and your compassion foremost in our ministries. Move among us with your gracious spirit. Draw us closer to each other and closer to you. Make us more and more thoroughly your own people. Hear our prayers for those who are struggling among us, those who are struggling with physical illness and recovery, those who are recovering from surgeries and medical interventions. Hear our prayers for those who have distresses in their families and in their places of employment that we do not know about or understand. But grant to those an, an added measure of your grace that they might see their way through those difficulties, see ways that they can address them and overcome them. But foremost of all, ways that they can put, that we can put all of our trust and our confidence in you, surrendering our lives into your keeping and our fortunes into your hands. Move among us with your gracious spirit, O God. Make us more and more thoroughly your own children. Guide and direct us in all that we do so that, so that we might be numbered among those who serve and glorify you. We offer ourselves to you along with our prayers in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen.